have all the comforts and conveniences of life. In fact, I did, but I opted out. Instead, I decided to devote my time to fight for equality of women. I just had these feelings, something's wrong, something's wrong. Then a friend handed me a feminine mystique. Betty Friedan's book, I mean, cried even today. It just hit me. It was where it was. Absolutely, absolutely. I read it that night. And, uh, and I just knew it wasn't him, it wasn't me, it was society. Well, the feminine mystique, it defines woman solely in terms of her sexual relation to man as uh, uh, man's sex object, as wife, mother, homemaker, and never in human terms as an individual person, as a human being herself. When Betty Friedan published The Feminine Mystique, everyone was buzzing about women and their talents being neglected. Every time we've been uh, told, I'm sorry, we don't hire women, we thought, you know, isn't it too bad there isn't an organization that can fight against that. In 1966, when they were founding now, Betty Friedan asked me if I would do the public relations. And I said, sure. We knew we were making history. We had no doubt that this was a historic occasion. We knew the world needed a civil rights organization for women's rights. That's one reason it exploded so really quickly and powerfully was because it was long overdue. The mayor this afternoon met the women's liberation movement in a way that he had not before. As soon as NOW existed and I heard about it, I was in NOW. I became president of the Chicago chapter of NOW. And against the women of this nation, and we intend to react. Some of the earliest letters that we got was, where are you, I can't find you. You know, there was no internet. There was mimeograph and stamps. That's what we had. Uh, these were people's membership coming in. Here's a woman, and this is so typical of the women joining now at the time, recruited by myself with a big exclamation point. Let's see. I've collected buttons all my life, so this was one of my favorites. Uppity Women Unite. We certainly did, didn't we? The most important motivation for all of us in founding now was jobs, employment discrimination. We all know that women are underpaid and overworked and there is no chance for advancement anywhere. We in now teach women how to fight discrimination against their own companies, how to sue their companies. They want ads for help wanted male, help wanted female, and all the good jobs, the career jobs for the males. In fact, there was one ad that said, just got your BA, want a, a job to be secretary of a good-looking uh, uh, executive, you might end up as his wife. I swear to you. I remember we had picketers outside the New York Times, and the man would have a sandwich board said, I got my job through the New York Times, and the woman's sandwich board said, I didn't. <laughs> I remember going on television shows when I was the chapter president, and people would seriously ask you whether you thought women should get equal pay. Well, do you think women should get equal pay? I mean, people would say that. You had to say, this wasn't just handed down from Moses, this was discrimination. What is the point of your march? Oh, man, I just have running around peace. I want peace now. I became aware of what was called the younger branch of the movement, and I was 30. But anyway, they identified themselves as women's liberation, and this was people coming out of the anti-war movement and the college movement and civil rights movement. In the Southern Civil Rights Movement, the most important role that anybody could play was the role of an organizer. You know, you met with people and you helped them find the courage to stand up, that it was their voice and their desires for change that gave a movement its power. I work in Alabama going door to door, canvassing, getting people to go register to vote. All the women I encountered who were working in the civil rights movement it was an impressive bunch of women. What I saw was a different image of what it meant to be a woman, a different model. And we do realize with every step forward and with every effort and sincere prayer that we will overcome. Yeah. Although I didn't fully realize it at the time, I was in fact getting the groundwork for being a feminist. And to feel that you can have the power in a group 
to do something that you think needs to be done that you could never do on your own. I think it's what I was looking for my whole life. All these other social change movements that were going on at that time led to the women's movement. They gave rise to women's consciousness of a need to operate on an equal basis. I was part of the civil rights movement. I was a big part of the anti-war movement while I was a graduate student at Berkeley. And women in the New Left started talking about what we were feeling. The women were very much discriminated against. The guys, their names weren't on things. They became the spokespeople. We were used to lifting envelopes. We did the grunt work. We did the real work, actually. We often did the real work of organizing. I had been at an SDS meeting and was talking, and I was a leader in the organization. And one of the guys in the group said, ah, shut up, sit down and shut up, to me. And we started talking about our role as women within SES. Why weren't we in the leadership positions? From that, it just kind of sparked in everybody a, a sense of recognition. I go, aha, this is like a shared thing. It's just not me feeling insecure. So at the anti-war demonstration to protest the election of Nixon, we decided we would come together as women for the first time and announce we had a movement. And Marilyn Webb gets up on the stage in front of this huge audience of new left men, and she starts trying to talk. Well, the moment I started, there was this, this crowd went crazy. And the men start whistling, catcalling, and saying things like, take her off the stage and fuck her. And people were yelling, fuck her down a dark alley. It was just, it was insane. And we were like all looking at each other like, what? I didn't expect movement men to behave like that, and I was shocked. People were organizing blacks, and people were organizing welfare mothers, and then we were organizing women, and that everybody would see this as another leg of the whole movement. But we weren't respected. The black liberation movement had come into its fore, and you're talking about liberation and freedom half the night on the racial side, and then all of a sudden men are going to turn around and start talking about putting you in your place. If you don't want any trouble. That was the contradiction in terms that we were no longer prepared to put up with. So 1968, we founded the SNCC Black Women's Liberation Committee to take up some of these issues. A number of women felt that we need to go off on our own and focus on what we needed to do in our fight for liberation. I was a graduate student at Berkeley. One day, I saw a little three-by-five card in the student union, and it's a women's group forming. And these consciousness-raising groups spontaneously grew up in many areas of the country. When I first heard about the women's liberation movement, I had two little kids under five. My connection with the world was, I felt, finished. During one of my crises of feeling that my life was over, I heard some young women talking about meetings they were having, and they were talking about women's liberation, and they gave the address of a meeting. So I went to this meeting, and there were these women talking about their lives as I had never imagined people could. Well, you need to be specially trained to be a housewife. You get married, you are a whole new set of rules. We still have to look a certain way and be a certain way. We went around the room, and people asked a very simple question. How would your life have been different if you had been a boy? Why do you think being a woman might limit you as a human being, your possibilities? We challenged concepts of masculinity. We challenged concepts of femininity. We talked about skin color, how young black women would put cream on in order to make themselves uh, light-skinned. Suddenly, everything was up for questioning. Women did all of the family and housework and cooking, and the men got to make the living and get all of the attention in the world. Why was that? Like, we don't even realize what goes on until we sit and compare it with other women. And we heard each other. We heard each other into speech. You could sense it, you could feel it, you could, you could cut it with a knife, as they say. It was, the room was electric with whatever was gonna be shared. So I said, I've had three abortions, and the last one was within the last year. And I started to cry, because I suddenly understood that I wasn't alone, that what I had considered personal embarrassment was something that was part of this whole larger experience. 
The big insight of the women's movement was that personal is political. Problems that you felt were happening to you alone probably were your fault. But if it's happening to other people, then it's a social problem and not just a personal problem. Once you stop blaming yourself for all of this, it was like somebody had lifted a rock off of you. And then here were women all around you who were ready to go out there and do something about it. In Washington, D.C., we were like, have a demonstration, we'll travel. We demonstrate, the halls of Congress we demonstrated outside of Congress. There was a group called Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell, which it was the action arm. People had kind of folding witch hats and capes in their bag. And we thought if we could dress up like witches and then give a hex to people, we wanted to challenge the white men's canon at the University of Chicago. And so part of the hex went, knowledge is power through which you control our mind, our spirit, our bodies, our soul. Hex! Yeah! What you see here is the beginning of a movement that women are human beings and that we have equal rights. We intend to go to school. We intend to have childcare so that we can go to school. We want the university to provide us with classes that teaches us about our history. Now, I was in the history department, and I knew Zip, mother, zero about women's history and we realized we didn't know very much about women's literature or women's art in fact we realized that we'd gotten degrees and we knew nothing about women well a group of us decided to call the press we took our advanced degrees some were phds some were master's degrees and we burned them in public that was a very hard thing to do because we were very proud of those degrees i felt so duped like I had been fooled my whole life. This America seemed like the perfect place to demonstrate the way women were just judged as sex objects, just judged by their looks. There were no such standards for men. We also recognized how racist those beauty standards were. We weren't going to have any of it. It was, all women are beautiful. That was one of our slogans. All women are beautiful. We had a freedom trash can. Guys were burning their draft cards. We would burn our bras and other instruments of female torture. Even though I was in now, I was always with the radicals. If they're going to demonstrate for Miss America, I'm going to be there. It was a blast, what can I say? It was very exciting. It was something now wouldn't do. They did things that were outrageous. And some of us thought that these would be made fun of, and they were. But they attracted media attention. Of course, they got results. But the best part came when, right at the moment when they were about to crown Miss America, the women who had snuck up into the balcony unfurled this huge banner over the edge of the balcony that said women's liberation. And the world got to see those words for the first time in a national scale. It was a great success. The feminists who are here tonight do not believe a woman's place is in the home, right? As feminists, what we believe in is very simple, and that is the social, economic, and political equality of the sexes. Because the relationship between the sexes is, in fact, a political relationship. We're an oppressed group, and we have been through history. We have to if you do something as remarkable as changing the relationship between the sexes, everything is at risk, every possible idea. And many people don't like it. Especially men don't like it. They're very threatened by it. Women's web really is a lot of insignificant people that are really trying to gain their own interests and boost their own ego be it by making rash statements or being on television or what have you. You're so oversensitive. Why are you so sensitive? Uh, we don't like being so sensitive. It's not pleasant. We don't like having to always be catching things. We'd rather they didn't exist. But as long as people are going to be insensitive to our position, we're going to have to keep correcting them because there's no other way to change the consciousness. Women given their educational status, can earn 60% of what men of the same education can. What that really means is that a woman with college education, BA, earns what a man does who has three years of high school. This is economic discrimination and exploitation. Women as well as men told me I was wrong, over and over again. Women are not oppressed. Well, what does it matter? Who cares? You have a lot of influence.
you were working against cultural norms. You're working against institutions. How do you feel about women's liberation? Women's place is more at home. Thank you, advance yourself too much. I know the girls in my office are the way I do. We're all right the way we are. Nothing wrong with this. Totally against it. I feel I don't know what they're being liberated from. Many women protested that they liked cooking and housework and catering to men, but I would argue with some woman who was being extremely defensive about the movement and then six months later would run into her at a demonstration. The status quo is being challenged by the women's liberation movement. Today, it's still a man's world. I started getting word from people I knew in the movement by then, and as I heard about these things, I was able to go out and shoot them. They startled Wall Street one day by an exhibition in which roles were reversed. Oh, they're so beautiful, all of them. Ah, oh, those men, those sex objects. It was reported in the newspaper that there was a woman who worked in the Wall Street area. She was very well endowed, and men would wait for her outside the Wall Street train station. And they would pinch her make sucking noises at her. And I thought, this is pretty disgusting. Oh, wow. Look at the legs on that one. So I organized what I rather grandly called the First National Ogilvy. Those pants, they just bring out your best. Hey, how do you like that hat over there? Oh, what a chef mom. All the very clever events help the women's movement a lot. Keep your best leg forward, sweetie. Now, it isn't my taste to do the kind of demonstrations and things that some of them did. But I was always sort of gleeful about it underneath, and I thought, you know, go for it. Oh, oh it's a hippie on Wall Street. Oh, I'm so turned on. We're trying to point out what it feels like to be whistled at, put down constantly sexually every time we walk down the street. And we don't want to be sexual objects anymore. Is love out? Is sex out? Unless men change, it's going to be very soon. Unlike now, we didn't want a piece of the pie. They wanted to change the pie. We were talking about changing the whole paradigm of the way men and women interact. What about marriage? Marriage is uh, unpaid labor. I mean, uh, it's a free household slave for each man. It will take a major social revolution for women to be truly liberated. We began to reinterpret the whole world, and it seemed that male supremacy and male chauvinism was everywhere, and it was. What's your general feeling about uh, the National Organization of Women's Complaints? <laughs> Become a member of the press club, you have to be 21 years of age and be a male. Please, or please, I will be taken. We will make an arrest. Now, please leave. I have no intentions of taking this thing down or changing this thing. If you can get a court order to take it down, fine. You have no intention of no. changing your policy of no. segregated facilities. Is that correct, sir? Uh, we're fine out there now. Come on, let's go. Do you discriminate by threat? Come on, let's get out of here. Come on, good. He has repeatedly used uh, his law classroom to espouse that women do not make good attorneys, that they're too emotional, they're vindictive. We were angry. Maybe the anger is what carried us through and made us fearless. In Washington, D.C., we had a very, very active women's liberation movement. I think we met every single day for something or other. We had this organizational structure with all the different groups, and we didn't want it to be hierarchical, so we decided on the name Magic Quilt. In Washington, it's populated by working class women. They were getting a fraction of the salaries they thought they should be getting. They weren't able to support their children. So we talked to government workers, clerical workers, and people talked to nurses. And all of these women responded so incredibly. It was like, yeah, yeah. Pretty soon, there were these meetings going on in New York where there weren't just a half a dozen women, but there were 50, 60, 80, even 100 of them. On one side of the block, there would be a Red Stockings meeting. On the other side of the block, there would be a witch meeting. There were conferences. People drove all night, all day to get to these conferences. I got up to Sandy Spring, and here were this bunch of women talking about how we would overthrow male supremacy with this movement. So we went back to Gainesville right away and started a women's liberation group. Somebody else would write a position paper in another city, they would send it, we would read it. Every time
time there was a meeting, we'd see all these pamphlets that just raced across the country. Why do women not get paid properly? Why do women not have childcare? They were consciousness raising too. All of these writings were very precious to all of us because they were the vanguard. There are a vast number of women who are beginning to wake out of the long sleep that is known as cooperation of one's own oppression and self-denigration. And they are banding together to make the beginnings of a new and massive women's movement in America and in the world. To establish true equality between the sexes. To break the old machine of um, sexual politics and to replace it with a more human and civilized world for both sexes. And to end the present system's oppression of men as well as of women. We had a lot to say. In answer to a man's question, what can I do about women's liberation? Wear a dress. Wear a dress that you made yourself or bought in a dress store. Wear a dress and underneath the dress wear elastic around your hips and underneath your nipples. Wear a dress and underneath the dress wear a sanitary napkin. Wear a dress and wear slingback shoes, high-heeled shoes. Wear a dress with elastic and a sanitary napkin underneath and slingback shoes on your feet and walk down Telegraph Avenue. In the Bay Area, poetry was a very big part of our cultural life. I think the West Coast, we were accustomed to thinking that skits and songs and poems were all part of a movement. We had the wonderful precedent of the beat movement. Sometimes a thousand people would show up for a poetry meeting. It was a fantastic experience, you know, both to be part of the audience and also to read. Author's gonna read first. I never saw a man in a negligee. Two times I wore special fucking gowns, you know the type, one look and he turns off the football game, but they never do. And I was so busy being dainty and smelling fresh, I couldn't hump, couldn't wiggle, couldn't sweat, couldn't scream, you know damn well I couldn't come. I started writing poetry, and then I decided I would start my own press. I called the press shameless hussy, because my mother used that term for women she didn't approve of, and no one approved of what I was doing. In 1969, when I started the press, only 6% of the books in America were by women. This is one of the famous poets that I published. This is Antaraki Shande, for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, became a very big deal on Broadway. And we got famous because of her and because of George Sand. George Sand had been unpublished in America for about 80 years. One of the earliest poets that I published was Susan Griffin. This is a poem for a woman doing dishes. This is a poem for a woman doing dishes. It must be repeated. It must be repeated again and again, again and again, because the woman doing dishes, because the woman doing dishes has trouble hearing, has trouble hearing. Sue and Ruth Rosen and I were all in a women's group. We decided that a newspaper was really essential for what we were doing. I saw the first issue of Aggie Day, and I immediately phoned them up. And I said, hi, I'm an artist, I want to work with you. It was so exciting. So I got into the second issue of the first Women's Liberation newspaper in the country. Here's one where I drew the Women's Liberation Movement as the Bride of Frankenstein. And you see how terrified all the various hippie types are. You know, the peace movement guy and the hippie guy and the black power guy are really afraid of this woman who has just emerged. And she's making the power sign. This was something so new and so exciting. And people read us. People read us. being subjected to a double message. Sex was supposed to be okay now, but if we were pregnant, it was our problem. There was this idea that even when abortion was illegal, middle-class women could always get it. I mean, this was not true at all. Thousands of women in the United States are hospitalized each year because of post-abortion complications. 5,000 of these women die. I had a very good friend in high school 
who went away to college and she subsequently had an illegal abortion and died. So within three or four months of going off to college, she was dead. People tried to self-abort. My best friend took pills and she had the miscarriage in the dorm shower with the, turned on really hard, hoping the noise would muffle the, her cries of pain. Some were able to find an abortion, some had to have the child that they didn't want. All those kinds of experiences we discovered were universal. And abortion became our big unifying issue. Yeah. to control their own bodies and to control their own lives. Not since the suffragettes fought for the right to vote has an issue been more critical to women than abortion. Somewhere around 1970, I went to an uh, abortion rights rally in San Francisco. And it was a sea of white women, very few women of color. And someone grabbed a bullhorn and asked for the African-American women who were there to gather under a tree. And we decided that we would form a group called Black Sisters United. And I was very glad that, you know, somebody called African-American women together and said, you know, maybe we have something to talk about that might be a tiny bit different from what's coming from the stage. And indeed we did. I was invited up to Harlem to speak at a event around abortion. Remember, in the black liberation movement, the big debate is abortion is genocide, women should have babies for the revolution. And I remember going up those stairs and my knees were literally knocking because this was a bunch of nationalists and I was really scared. I concentrated a lot about the deaths of black women as a result of illegal abortion and how we should be able to choose when we want to have children so I managed to survive, you know, some of the attacks. And on my way out, twice it happened. One woman said to me, whispered to me, thank God you speak up. Thank God you're speaking up. And another, as I was approaching the door, said, right on. Right on. Dear brothers, poor black women decide for themselves whether to have a baby or not have a baby. Black women are being asked by militant black brothers not to practice birth control because it's a form of whiteies committing genocide on black people. Well, true enough. But black women in the United States have to fight back out of our own experience of oppression and having too many babies stops us from teaching them the truth, from supporting our children, and from stopping the brainwashing, as you say, and fighting black men who still want to use and exploit us was very difficult for middle-class white women to have any conception about what was going on in communities of color. And those differences could have been in conversation with each other, but if there isn't even an acknowledgement that there's differences in experience and perspective, and the voice of one is used as the voice of all, then you have a problem. That was during a period when black women did not particularly identify with the women's movement. Mrs. Norton, why are you a black woman involved in women's liberation? I'm involved in uh, the struggle for women's rights uh, because I believe women are disadvantaged. Black women are no less than white women, indeed black women, far more than white women. Women who have spent uh, their lives uh, working in other women's kitchens uh, uh, have a different kind of handicap than women who have been oppressed for their sex in other ways. We were grappling with that idea of how do you integrate race, class, and gender that's the reason why we had some reservations about the term feminism, because feminism was just seemed to be dealing with the female aspect of your being. It's important to keep in mind that black women are organized in their own organizations, in their own version of black women's liberation. Black Sisters United was a, essentially a consciousness raising group. And it was in that group the very first conversations I'd ever had about differences in sexual orientation. It was the first group I was in in which there were lesbian women. And so um, it was a, just a deep learning experience. There may be some here today that will be homosexual in the future. There are a lot of kids here. There may be some girls that will turn lesbian. We don't know. They can be anywhere. They can be judges, lawyers. 
We ought to know we've arrested all of them. I told no one I went to college with that I was a lesbian. I never told anyone. When I got to Barnard, one of the first stories I heard was that there were two women in the dorm room who were making out, and a guy at Columbia with binoculars saw them, and they were expelled. The message of that story was certainly that one could not be an open lesbian at Barnard. What the 60s were like for many of us, we grew up in silence and isolation and shame. And that's why consciousness raising was so appealing because so much of our lives we could not speak of. The women's movement had coined the motto, the personal is political. But when you were a lesbian and you wanted to talk about lesbian relationships as opposed to heterosexual relationships, uh, they didn't want to hear about it. And here I have to give a lot of credit to Rita Mae Brown. One thing you were not going to tell Rita was to shut up. I knew that I was as good as they were. And I knew I am not who I sleep with. I was a now. And as now went on, I called him on the carpet about class. I called him on the carpet about race. And then I called him on the carpet about lesbianism. And I said, you are treating women the way men treat you. And those women are lesbians. Oh, my God, you would have thought I unleashed an elephant in the middle of the room. There were a lot of women who were gay, but they didn't talk about being gay. They used to say that the novel meetings was the best cruising place in town. So Betty Fidan was freaking out. You know, she was saying, you can't bring this up now. This is divisive. This is what men call us anyway. You know, any woman that stands up for herself is called a dyke. And she said, this is like a lavender menace. We can't have it. The fact that we were beginning to be recognized and treated decently was something. And all of a sudden, the gay issue, Betty was really, really concerned that he was going to destroy it. But Betty wasn't the only one concerned. A lot of us were concerned. I was concerned, too. It's too soon. That's what we thought. Too soon. They couldn't bustle me out of that organization fast enough. I was thrown out. I thought, you know, we really need to talk about what is happening to, to lesbians. Why are we reviled by what should be our own people? So it was a group of lesbians from Red Stockings and lesbians from uh, the Gay Liberation Front who started meeting together. And out of that, we decided to write a lesbian feminist position paper, which was the first of its kind. We each tried to write a piece of this thing. And we put it all together, and it became the Woman Identified Woman. In essence, give your energies to other women. I don't even know who came up with such a wonderful opening line. A lesbian is the rage of all women condensed to the point of explosion. Towards May 1970, there was the second Congress to unite women, but there was not going to be a single panel that dealt with homophobia or lesbianism. And we decided we were going to do an action. We had been labeled the Lavender Menace. So on the day of the Congress, we came in looking like we were part of the crowd. And we had a buddy back behind the curtains who knew how to run the lights and so the lights went out. <laughs> and when the lights went out, like Superman, we removed our blouses and exposed our Lavender Menace t-shirts. The audience was completely surrounded by lesbians. I was a plant in the audience and I pulled off my blouse and I had a Lavender Menace t-shirt underneath. I said, I'm tired of being in the closet in this movement. Well, nobody knew, excuse the southern expression, they didn't know whether to shit run or go blind. They did not know what to do. And finally, we took over the stage and we demanded that issues of lesbianism be put on the agenda, and they were. It really did awaken people. It was like, oh, you know, you're kind of right. It was a lot of fun. When feminism first erupted, it was for me an extremely erotic moment. I think for the first time, I saw the possibility of what I was really being beautiful. I had kind of been a nerdy intellectual. I felt that I couldn't be myself and be attractive to guys. So the idea that wearing what you felt like and letting your hair go wherever it wanted to be was actually considered attractive was very exciting. Radical feminists were really the first to argue that women's emotional and sexual needs should be equally important to men's. Well, when we started talking about sex, it turned out that very few of us had ever even had an orgasm. Not only that, but we were faking those orgasms. And I don't know exactly how we knew how to fake them. Because if we'd never had one, how did we know how to fake it? 
the dissatisfaction of this new generation of young women who are having more sex than women ever had before, but not enjoying it particularly. And once we started going on it, we didn't stop until we were able to demand a decent sexual experience from our lovers. Part of what distinguished the women's liberation branch from the more middle-aged, middle-class group was the interest in sexuality and personal liberation. The sexuality stuff was a little daunting to me. And, you know, even at the NOW conferences later on, I mean, women, they brought speculums and they examined each other's vaginas and stuff. I, I was like, I was not into that. I, that was not me. That, I was not doing that. This is the group's first picture. This is Wendy, Paula, Esther, Joan, me, Valenia, Jane, Norma, Pamela, Ruth, Miriam, and Judy. We look impossibly young. Why does a woman's hormonal system have to be fucked around with all the time when it's very complicated and very necessary to procreate the species when, in fact, it makes much more sense to have a, a pill for a male whose hormonal uh, the system is not as complicated. People were very fired up about birth control. People were having a terrible time, particularly because it was Massachusetts mm -hmm. and birth control was illegal. The thing that struck me the most was that everyone had a doctor's story that they wanted to share. And some of it was about getting the information, but some of it was just about being patronized. Mm -hmm. And there was just the sense of, oh, don't worry your pretty little head about that. And there was an attitude mm -hmm. also, even when I gave birth to my, to my daughter, she was born around four in the morning and he came in a few hours later and he said, well, how did you like the job I did? <laughs> we then made a list of subjects that we want information about. You know, only people in their 20s would have the chutzpah to make a list from birth to death. Okay, we need to know about anatomy. We need to know about birth control. We need to know about pregnancy, postpartum, nutrition. We need to know about exercise. We need to know about menopause, death, you know, the whole gambit. I went to the doctor. I had an abnormal pap test. I went home, I wrote about it. And so there was a constant flow between what you lived, what you learned, what you could give out. So at the point at which we were ready, we said, well, we're gonna do a course. We had this material that we wanted to share. The first course was on masturbation. <laughs> Nobody had ever said that word out loud at MIT in a, in a room, and you could hear a pin drop. I remember her standing up, this tall, beautiful woman, and she's writing about masturbation, everybody's like, oh my god. <laughs> and she had this drawing of a vagina with all the anatomical parts, and she started talking about, you know, what our genitals look like. Whoa, you know, <laughs> never heard or thought about any of this before. So this was quite compelling. I remember so, that uh -huh. after the first session, everybody mm -hmm. said, well, we want to have all the information. What are those pieces of paper that you have? Everybody wanted copies mm -hmm. of yes. each of the topics of the course. Then yeah. we said, this is going to become a book. We each took the subject that most involved us personally mm -hmm. and started to learn more about mm -hmm. it so we would have a, a larger, ch a larger mm -hmm. chapter. Right. The first version, the newsprint version, sold 240,000 copies. Suddenly, we had this book and it's a bestseller and it was something that no one ever anticipated. We felt like that any money this mm -hmm. book was going to make came out of women's lives because women needed it. Mm -hmm. And so we would use the money to fund women's health stuff. We made our chapters of these letters that came in with these personal experiences. Mm -hmm. Any anecdote became material for the book. What we were saying is we're a living lab, you know, that no one knows that much about women's laws. I said, we're going to sell a million copies, and people laughed. Right. And I thought, no, because every woman has a body. It doesn't matter what the class or color you are, we all have the same anatomy. Holy cow. I'm not the drone, okay? If Ken finds out I have this, he'll kill me. My background was very, very different from many of the people I met on the left in general. My family were sharecroppers from Oklahoma, and we were very, very poor. For me, anything negative that ever happened had to do with class. I was being put down, even when men were misogynist. It's because of class. You know, I didn't, I didn't internalize it. It's because that's the way they treat women. 
so it wasn't until I was at UCLA, I started seeing how stacked the deck was against a woman. I got a professor, a young professor. The first day he met with me, he says, if I can't fuck you, I, I'm going to fuck you. So I quit. I quit graduate school. I burned all my bridges. Yeah, and that's when I flew out to start a women's revolution. I am a revolutionary. I'm a feminist. There is no possibility for me to be liberated except that all women be liberated. And that means power and control on a political, economic level. Having had nothing, I will not settle for crumbs. We formed a group called Cell 16. We had a motto that we were going to change the world forever and totally. We didn't tone it down at all. There were murders that summer in Boston, and it was headlines, more slaying girls. We started street patrols for the factories down by the river. Very dark when the women got off, and they were constantly being mugged and assaulted and raped. The first time something did happen on a patrol, these guys yelled at us, a uh, bunch of lezzies. I went up and punched him. And Abby did an upper block. The guy ran. He was the most terrified man in Boston that night. <laughs> this convinced us all we really needed to make self-defense a priority. So we started recruiting women for an all-women's class. And we went from just our group to about 100 people. It was important to all of us that we own the streets. One evening, in my Tuesday Night Consciousness Raising group, West Village One of New York Radical Feminists, Diane Crothers walked in with the newspaper, It Ain't Me Babe, from San Francisco, and said, there's an article here we all have to read. And it was a story about a woman in Marin County who'd been raped during a hitchhike. We read the article and we went around the room, and it turned out one woman, Sarah, had been raped. And the police said to her, who'd want to rape you? A friend of mine was raped at knife point in her bed in off-campus housing. I went with her to the student health service, and she was given a lecture on her promiscuity. It was very common in a courtroom to blame the woman for the rape. And rape was looked at as a crime that occurred because a man had strong sexual urges that he couldn't satisfy any other way. And it was only with the feminist women that it came out that rape is not a crime of passion. It's a crime that expresses the urge to dominate. People were not used to thinking of rape as a political crime against women. That was our slogan. Rape is a political crime against women. The Chicago Women's Liberation Rock Band was huge. In those days, they had to have balls to be a rock musician. Well, guess what? No. Seeing women being smarter and tougher, and the rock band was a fabulous example of that because of being loud on top of everything else. <laughs> Chicago was a hotbed of feminist organizing. There were a lot of people doing a lot of things. And there was no communication amongst us. There was no structure to bring us together. And at the same time, there were a lot of new people who were interested in the women's movement, women who were reaching out. And so we decided to form the Chicago Women's Liberation Union as a way to network us all together. There was the Chicago Women's Graphics Collective, the Action Committee for Decent Child Care. We built a speakers bureau the Liberation School for Women. Then we would have an open orientation session and we would put about 30 chairs out and we would get over 100 women. We didn't know who these women were. We didn't know how they learned about us, but they kept coming and they kept coming. They had classes on stuff women need to know, automobile repair, women's history, the facts of women's lives. Why have a school? Because these things are not being taught in the schools. I taught women's sexuality, 
contraception, abortion. Abortion was a very important issue to both groups at that time, with now doing more of the legal work and the women's union doing more of the direct service work. In 1964, a friend mentioned that his sister was pregnant and nearly suicidal. Could I do anything about it? And I was referred through a series of connections to a doctor. Asked him if he would perform an abortion. He said yes. And a few weeks later, someone else called and said they also were looking for an abortion. The word had spread. And at that point, I decided to set up a bit of a system. I was living in a dormitory at the time. And so I told people to ask for Jane. I could tell within the first minute what they were calling about. Because there was a pause, there was a hesitance, there was a tension. Many were frightened. Because three people discussing an abortion in those days was a conspiracy to commit felony murder. Jane was this service that was established in Chicago that provided abortions when abortion was illegal. We would have women call us who were in need of the abortion service, and of course having Jane available without having to refer them to the mob was a godsend. The group would take in the calls, and we would do counseling. Then women would be brought to specific houses on a rotating basis where the procedures would be done. The service moved every day from somebody's home to somebody's home, which is quite amazing. I joined the abortion service because I knew that women are sometimes desperate and they are going to hurt themselves in order to end their pregnancies. When I began Jane work, a few dozen women a week were coming through. After about six months, there were at least a hundred women coming through. Ultimately, one really good abortionist taught Janes how to do abortions with skill and care. And then those Janes taught other Janes. All of us were always aware that what we were doing was illegal, that we could go to jail. You might have to throw everything in your bag and run down the back stairs at any moment. But we understood that it was important work, useful work, necessary work. What is the relationship of, of the movement to the, the whole question of motherhood and the affection of mothers for children and so forth? It's about being able to have children if you want them and being able not to have children if you don't want them. And if you want to have your kids in daycare centers, if you want to work, then you can do that too. In the women's movement, the myth was that we hated men, that we hated marriage, we hated children. That's not right. The group I was in, we talked mostly about childcare being the absolute precondition for women's emancipation. One of the earliest battles was for child care. It said now a statement of purpose. We knew that women could not hold jobs and be promoted until society recognized its uh, obligation to help take care of our children. And I remember at some of the early demonstrations, those who had kids, we would bring the kids, and people would say things like, oh, we can't talk with you nursing the babies and stuff like that, and we would say, show us a daycare center. We'll be happy to bring the kids to the daycare center. Feminists are accused of uh, warning women out of the home and leaving children come what may. We take home and we talk about 24 hours child care. We need to have it now. 24 hours child care centers today. Now it's the same as After a great deal of work where feminists were in the leadership, we got close to having a real child care system. In 1971, amazingly enough, the women's movement, the Congress, the Senate, pass a comprehensive child care act. Most historians don't even remember that. Forget about the rest of society. And President Nixon vetoed it. He said, we don't want to make our women like Soviet women. We want women to take care of their own children. That was a tragic moment in history. And we've been paying for it ever since. It's one thing for women to pay the price. It's another thing for generations of children to pay the price as well. I can think of, frankly, of no more important issues that early feminists raise than educational child care. Happy girls, black women, women on welfare, are often sterilized against their will. I mean, that's been known to happen. The same hospital that wants to sterilize the black women will not let a middle-class white woman be sterilized. If she says, I don't want to have any more children, they say, you have to be crazy. Be crazy. You, gotta tell you me have to have a medical reason. You have to be yeah. sick. There has to be something wrong with you. Those things are two ends of the same dimension. It's still the issue of control over one's body, whether it's, it's the right to have children if you want them, or the right not to. In Puerto Rico, over one third of the women on the island have been sterilized. That means over one third of the women are never going to be able to hold a baby in their arms. 
women in Puerto Rico were used as guinea pigs, as a way of controlling the population. And then with that sterilization program being brought to New York City, we actively organized raising the consciousness about this. The Young Arts Party was dedicated to issues affecting Puerto Ricans in the United States. We were the first ones to begin to articulate an idea of reproductive justice. It's just as important for women in our communities to be able to have children, raise children that don't go hungry, have daycare, as well as have access to birth control and a right to a safe abortion. The kind of developing feminism that we had in the Young Lords was make very clear decision not to separate, to wage struggle internally with our brothers. The men had written this program. One of the points out with revolutionary machismo. What an oxymoron. We weren't having it. So we formed a women's caucus and made demands on the men in the organization. It was ultimately changed to, we want equality for women, down with machismo and male chauvinism. It was important that it's not just women making that statement. It should be men saying, yo, brother, that's really a macho attitude you're taking. You need to check your shit. And, and that's what happened. What does women's lib mean to you? I think they have a lot of good points, uh, extremely fine points. Uh, the abortion laws are ridiculous. Uh, the fact that uh, unequal pay, that's, that's ridiculous. They're not after your job? No, I don't think so. I don't think I can do my job. I think the no bra thing is ridiculous. Um, I'm not so sure about the day centers. The girls, I think, have got it over the guys. They get everything paid for and everything else. I don't see what, what they're really arguing about. Men treat them like ladies as long as they acted like ladies. And I'm afraid we're losing that femininity. By that time, we were so angry that it wasn't so far such a reach to say, why are you sleeping with men? Aren't you sleeping with the enemy? There were a lot of women very open to the idea that they should be gay. The Furies had come to Washington, D.C. The Furies was a collective of all women, most of whom were gay. My God, what a trip that was. I'm glad I did it. I really am. But there, you know, all these women in one house, it was like PMS in concert. We were talking about what really is a lesbian and how should a lesbian live and we should withdraw all of our energies from men, all this kind of stuff. Could we live together in this way and prove that it could be done? And I think in many ways it worked, but in other ways it didn't. It became too ideological, of which I was guilty, you know. I remember being pregnant with Eric and sitting there in the Women's Liberation Office when the Fury's announcement came that male infants were the enemy, that women could not come into the office with a male child. That stopped me short. This was even before I had my own kid. This is wrong. Women's Liberation had that, you know, the danger. You begin to tell each other what to do. You begin to tell each other how to think. You begin to pressure people. You need to leave him. And that there were some women afterwards that were sorry that that's what they did. We were inventing things, and that's a very interesting edge to be on. We were still figuring out what it meant to create a movement that could help to change the whole world's perception of women, challenge patriarchy. You don't have much help, and you don't have many clues about how to proceed. You know, we were figuring it out, and it wasn't always easy, and we didn't always do it right. Part of the reaction of first New Left Women, and then it spread to other women, to male-dominated authority, was not only to view structure as bad, but leaders as bad. What women were trying to do was to not have leadership that was a hierarchy, but to have leadership that is collective. I mean, in a certain way, it was modeled on utopian ideas, but there invariably became some people who were more listened to than others, I guess, is the only way you can say. And I was one of those people. Part of this exuberance of women finding a movement that was gonna help them find their own voice there was also a competition for leadership at the same time. Because this was, for many of us, our one shot 
to be progressive leaders and be recognized and be able to get our ideas heard. The first core concept of sexist thought is that men do the important work in the world and that the work... Doing the kinds of things that were normally associated as male activities, being interviewed, getting your name in the press, making speeches, giving lectures, those kinds of things, those were condemned. The only people I had seen in leadership roles were men. So, to be fair, maybe I was mimicking a male-style leadership. So they kicked me out of Magic Quilt. It was devastating to have all these people sit in a room that you had organized in a group to say, get out. People had read about me, so I was like this mini celebrity. In Cell 16, they said that I was oppressing them. That's the most incredible thing anyone ever said to me, I think, is that I feel oppressed just by the fact that you exist. Okay. <laughs> uh, you want me to stop existing? Listen, I dropped out of the women's movement three times. 69, 79, and 89. <laughs> the women's movement brought about a social revolution in this country. And while it was painful to be part of that social revolution, it had to be done. Everybody had taken the birth control pill. Back then, a huge amount of estrogen. Nobody had informed us that there could be side effects. My side effect was my hair started to fall out. And we got word of hearings on the Hill about the birth control pill. All the people listed to testify were male doctors and drug company executives, males, all. Not one patient, not one woman, nothing. I've seen the women with thrombophobitis, weight gain, nausea, irritable bowel, cancer of the breast, rheumatoid arthritis like syndrome. Serious reactions, the blood clots, the heart attacks, the strokes. They knew about it when they gave it to us, when they dispensed it like handy. I want to know how many side effects we have to hear before somebody does something about these pills. We are not going to stick by it any longer. You are murdering us to your profit and convenience. You ladies would uh, sit down. I'm not going to interrupt it by taking this pill. We're conducting. I don't think the hearing is any more important than our lives. Uh, well, everybody please leave the room. Pass and everyone else. That's a fine way to run. We stopped the hearing. And they tried to bargain with us. Because we were demonstrating every time they reconvened them. Yes, we are objecting to the fact that there are no women testifying and that there are no women on the panel. We are tired of men controlling our lives and our bodies. And one of our absolute bottom lines was there had to be information given to women. And we did get the first patient package insert, which is informed consent. We were bringing DC to its knees around women's issues. The director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, found a new and, to his mind, potentially dangerous group, the Women's Liberation Movement. Hoover sent the following directive, quote, It is absolutely essential that we conduct sufficient investigation of the Women's Liberation Movement to determine any possible threat they may represent to the security of the United States, end quote. J. Edgar Hoover said women couldn't be agents, so the FBI got women who were informants. These informants were sitting in on women's consciousness raising groups, writing stories back to their agents saying, you know, they're just talking about the fact that men aren't doing child care, they're not washing the dishes, they're leaving a mess, they expect us to do everything. I don't see why I should sit in on any more. They would forward that to J. Edgar Hoover, who would write back and say, continue surveillance, these women represent a national security threat. The irony is, for the most part, women did not do anything dangerous or violent. The really dangerous thing was talk because telling the truth and talking is very revolutionary. We need to do a very hypocritical thing about the education of women. We pretend there's a lot of opportunity out there. So study hard girls and go forward. Uh, and there isn't any opportunity out there, and everyone's kidding them. Racism and anti-feminism are two of the prime traditions of this country. I no longer accept society's judgment that my group is second class. If women are to be married, women should receive pensions. All women are lesbians, except those who don't know it naturally. They are, but don't know it yet. I am a woman and therefore a lesbian. We talk in different tones. We don't all agree. We have the right to define our own differences. Now, I would like to ask Jemen Greer, I really don't know what women are asking for. Now, suppose I wanted to give it to them. Listen, you may as well relax, because whatever it is they're asking for, honey, it's not for you. No.
company are going to see to it that the insane directions of this country get changed, that we stop the business of having wars and military programs, stop the business of having some money for health and housing and child care, and we're going to see to it there's a liberation not only of women, but men and women. It's John I've been very interested to see the amount of publicity that has gone to the women's liberation movement in just the last two or three months. We couldn't get coverage anywhere except in a very joking fashion in, in uh, 1966. Everybody thought it was a colossal joke. I think people aren't laughing anymore. They recognize the seriousness of it. At the now National Convention for 1970, Betty Finance gets up and gives her speech. And much to our shock, she announced that there would be a women's strike on August 26, 1970, the 50th anniversary of women's right to vote. When we take to the streets in Boston and in New York and in Chicago and in Atlanta and in Florida and in California and in speak and everyone was like, oh my God, now what do we do? So Betty Friedan tells the press, 50,000 women would march from New York City. Every week we would have a notice in the village voice. These younger women, they would pour into now and we would plan this march and strike. Don't iron while the strike is hot was the slogan. And we took this poster and distributed it all over town. And I said, how are we going to get 50,000 to march? And Pat said, we'll take over the Statue of Liberty. And I said, how can you do that? The Puerto Ricans did last year and they're in jail. So they got two huge banners, 40 feet long. Yeah, they had the banners rolled up in their jeans, you know, and they were walking like they were crippled. We got to the island, so we had a group that was going to start demonstrating. I was going to go up, up the winding stairs and stairs at the top one, where we were putting Women of the World Unite. I just remember the wind was so strong. And the next thing we knew, the guys caught on. By this time, there were helicopters. And then Mayor Glancy called and he said, let the women be, let them alone. Glory, glory, it was a sensation. It went around the world. Time Magazine picked it up, the Italians, the French. It was fabulous. Can you imagine women in the world, you know? All that publicity helped. Well, tomorrow, 50 years after we gave them the vote, the women are going to strike to support their liberation demands. Thankfully, Cedar Rapids Women's Liberation Movement is pretty much dormant. If I knew uh, what they were going on strike for, I'd be able to answer. No, I don't think I will. I don't think that's necessary at all. I don't think too much of it. A woman's place is in the home. So remember, men, if you come to work tomorrow and your secretary refuses to do the filing and then go home and find that your wife has refused to do the cooking, don't blame them. Remember, you gave them the vote 50 years ago. This is Mike Scott, male chauvinist, TV9 Eyewitness News. The press just thought this was so crazy. And this kept working for us in some ways. The Sun-Times put out a headline the day before, Will Women Strike? So the day of the march, I was walking towards Fifth Avenue, scared to death that I was going to see only 3,000. And I will never, never forget. You couldn't see the end of the line. When you looked out, Everybody. I mean, there were women as far as you could see. People were cheering us. They hung out of the windows and out of balconies and cheered us on and waved flags for us. I was recognizable in New York then, so I put one of these African turbans on my head, wore some African garb to say, see, I'm in the women's movement. What's, what's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong in a traffic girl can make more money as a playboy bunny or a cover girl than anything else. I'll never be more shocked than I was when I walked up on the podium that day and looked out and saw the entire plaza was filled. And feeling the support of these thousands of people all at once, it was an exhilarating feeling. Men want to do things with joint women. 
women in making this a society that cares about all people. Equal pay, equal work, and we want it now! Hey, well, I would love to say the women and the men putting their, their fingers up like this. And we now know that we have the power to unite together, to work together, to make the changes that are needed. And that we have your attention, and that we have the headlines in the media. You didn't make us, we are making you take us to the It felt like we had triumphed. It felt like we were changing the world. Now we are a movement. You know, it's probably no accident that we, in our time, didn't know anything about the suffrage struggle and how long it took to get the vote, 50 years. You know, I'm one of the few left who could say their mother worked for suffrage. I'm very proud of that. My mother felt so strongly about getting the vote and she was so thrilled to get it. And I loved going with her to vote when I was only five. And they'd pull that curtain and nobody could only see people's feet. I, I just found that kind of mystical and I still do. And, and I later uh, decided the two emancipators of women were the vote and birth control. We live in a country that doesn't credit any of its radical movements. They don't like to admit in uh, the United States that change happens because radicals force it. To take away the history of how change got made helps to cut down on activism because people don't think that I, an everyday person, could make a big social change. The Supreme Court gave us Roe versus Wade and I'm just a regular woman. But that's who made abortion rights come. Just a student and just a mother and gathering together and protesting. This is our Bodies Ourselves ninth edition. It just came out two weeks ago. We are so happy. It's um, like our baby. It's amazing to think that we have been around for 40 years. And to me, the global piece has been so amazing. Our Bodies Ourselves has given any group of progressive women in any country the text of the book to adapt it to their own cultural context. There have been these marvelous projects that have started throughout the world, and it's been going on since the 70s, really. Mama Asiya from Tanzania. For our 40th anniversary, women came from Israel, from Nepal, from Turkey, from Armenia, from Nigeria, from Tanzania. They have amazing stories to tell. In India, when I was doing the work with um, the Bangla version of Obos, young girls hadn't heard of it, but they were jubilant that something like this was coming to them. And they all said, oh, this is going to take us to a very different place. So thank you, all of you, for giving us back our bodies and the right to health. Thank you so much. I think there are great achievements of the women's movement. The women's health movement is one of them. We named sexual harassment. We named domestic violence, the battering of wives. We then made it illegal. Every aspect of life has changed. Families are different. My daughter is leading a completely different life because of the women's movement. They both take care of the children. They both earn money. They both work. There's still some sex segregation in the workforce, for sure. But there are whole fields that were simply closed down to women. And that's done with. I don't think we're going back on that. I think the most profound thing that feminism did for me was to make me feel that I was capable of genuine freedom. Before the women's movement, I had my own work. I knew I wasn't going to live a traditional woman's life, I felt that I probably wasn't going to have children. And ultimately, I did have my daughter. And I think, were it not for feminism, I don't think I could have done that. Right after I got out of college, it was November 2006, my mother passed away. And I got all of these letters and emails from her friends, her colleagues, all of the feminists that started women's liberation movement. And I started to realize that even though I was down with the word feminism, I didn't really know what it meant to me and to our generation. I think the sexism that we experience is a little bit more insidious and it's harder to sort of point out and say, see, see, that's sexism. 
but I know a lot of young kick-ass feminists out there. They're blogging, they're out in the streets, they're organizing. There's this new movement called Slut Walk that has now swept 70 different cities. And it was started by a young woman who heard a cop say about a woman who was raped, well, she was asking for it, she was dressed like a slut. Believe it or not, people are assaulted regardless of what they wear. Some people who get raped are in for guns. We created a revolution that we are still debating in our society. We're still arguing over many issues that women raised 40 years ago, like abortion, like childcare. We still don't have any child care. In terms of reproductive health, reproductive justice, we've gone backward in a big way. If we can have order in the chamber so that the members can properly cast the vote. The bitter lesson is that no victories are permanent. All our rights are like that. They're only as good as we maintain them. I'm seriously disheartened by the current situation, but at the same time, I'm angry. And one of the things I learned decades ago, when we're that angry about something that bad, we take action against it. I want people to know that if they organize, they can actually make really profound change. That all women may be free! You know, you can't convince me you can't change the world because that's not happening. But this is a moving target. Freedom is something that is over the horizon, and you can't stop sailing toward it just because you don't reach it. You just keep going, and every generation has another opportunity to take it further. Come on, come on, come on.